Home Life It's Home Plus Life Podcast Alrighty, well, we're back Yep Another episode and we are in the heart of Queensland's real estate industry, if you will We are at the REIQ with the wonderful, indomitable CEO, <laughs> Antonia Merkel. How are you, Antonia? I'm well, thank you. Great to be with you. It's awesome to be here. Thank you very much for having us and hosting us in, in you know, REIQ HQ. Uh, it's, it's awesome to be here. So we, we've got a heap of questions to talk to you about today. We, we want to pick your brain on things like the housing crisis. Um, we want to dive into some government policies that may or may mm. not be coming up, some things that are in place right now and what people need to be aware of. And, of course, there's an election coming up in Queensland, so maybe we should all be aware about this time. Yeah. Uh, we're going to jump into some of the core stuff that you guys are doing at the REIQ to restore trust in the industry and to really set better standards. Um, we'll talk a little bit about advocacy and what you guys do, because you guys, you guys operate a lot behind the scenes. We do. People, like, I feel homeowners don't really know the amazing Cape Crusaders that you guys are and what you do. So I think if we jump into a They're bit of that, that'd be cool. Squirrels they of are. the real estate industry. They are. <laughs> I might reveal a few secrets yeah. today. Oh, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, and look, we'll we'll talk too about why it's so important to choose an REIQ agent, mm. a member agent. Yeah. I think that's that's huge. And then we might just jump into anything else that we've got time to discuss. Because look, I, I imagine these opportunities don't come along. You know, too often, and I would love to sit and pick your brains on behalf of our our watchers, listeners, and and behalf of homeowners all over Queensland uh, as much as I can. So, as long as I can keep you here, I will. Let's do it. <laughs> Sounds like fun. All righty. Well, let's let's look at it. Queensland's a bit of a mess at the moment in terms of housing. Mm. We're seeing a rental market go nuts. We're seeing sales market go nuts. In fact, better than anywhere in the country. Just an FYI on the data, we're seeing about 10.9 buyers on average making 20 plus offers per property in 2024 mm. uh, at the present point in time. What do you see is the key sort of factors, the contributing factors for this housing crisis that we're seeing at the moment? Well, I think there's a number of factors. I think we've got to acknowledge what a wicked problem it is. Um, mm. This is not something that's emerged overnight and consequently... Sadly, we won't be able to fix it uh, overnight either. Um, so there's a few things going on. If we start with uh, the rental crisis, and, and, and I don't like to use the term crisis very liberally, but quite frankly, there's no other way to characterise what we're experiencing here in Queensland. We have obscenely low vacancy rates. Uh, in regional Queensland, most of regional Queensland is sitting at sub 1%. Brisbane's wow. sitting at around 1%. And just for some context, we classify a healthy rental market as a vacancy rate that sits between 26 up to 3.5%. Yeah, so right. it's sub 1%, and I'm talking in some areas as low as 0.5%, 0.2%. And regional too. Regional is, is actually where, in many respects, it's, it's the tightest. So, so we've got this really very tight rental market, and that's why we're seeing queues of people out the front of mm. rental properties and it's why also there is just such a huge amount of stress in the tenant community at the moment as well as in property management community. So that's really tough. What we're seeing is just this demand for rental property up here but but the supply just is not matching. There's this uh, really material mismatch between the level of demand and what's actually available. Um, so that's part of the problem. And then, of course, the other issue is that we've got one of the lowest populations. In fact, no, I take that back. We have the lowest uh, home ownership rates of any state in the nation. Wow. And what we've been seeing progressively is that the number of homeowners has been progressively on a decline. So, of course, what that means is that's that extra group of people who would ideally like to transition into home ownership but are struggling to do so, and we'll get to that. And so, therefore, they are adding to that rental burden, if you like. Yeah. So, so the number of people renting is on the rise and conversely the number of homeowners is on is is in the decline. So we're on a mission to try and get 
that that equilibrium back. Usually it's a 70-30 split we like to see, so about 30% of the population renting their home. We've historically always had around 30% of Queenslanders renting their home. That, that's about right and that's fairly consistent with the national average, but we're up to around 36% of Queenslanders renting. Um, and so, of course, a big part of the problem is supply. Yeah. We have a growing population. During COVID, we obviously saw uh, enormous uh, numbers of people uh, migrating to Queensland, predominantly from Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, so obviously that's a great thing in many respects for the yeah. economy. Uh, we want to be uh, throwing our borders open open and welcoming more people. There are a lot of benefits that come with that, but the challenge has been housing everyone. Uh, we've got, uh, when we look at the pipeline of what's ahead in terms of new construction, it's pretty woeful and we know that we're going to continue to experience uh, a growing population. So um, those are those are sort of the fundamental issues at play. In terms of the way to fix it, there's lots of people who have lots of views. Of course, REIQ was part of the uh, housing summit um, that uh, the government hosted a few years ago now, a couple of years ago. Uh, there were lots of stakeholders in that room, lots of good opportunities and ideas, uh, but sadly none of that's really translating into a material shift. Um, so what we really need is, uh, gosh, where do I start? We need to be thinking about modern methods of construction. How can we be getting good quality prefab uh, uh, modular housing in, into market? We know that getting that into market is faster than the traditional construction mm. methods. We're not saying let's move to that exclusively, but that's a really good way of being able to get some extra supply quite quickly. Um, we need to see local governments all around the state doing more to really streamline that process um, that, that, that rests with them in terms of that red tape that's associated with, with new construction. But the challenge is that um, many councils have, done, have, have been really proactive, but what we're also seeing is that sometimes you're getting the approvals and then that's not translating into actual construction. Yeah. And that comes yeah. back to cost of construction, comes back to the issue of finding a builder and tradies, which is still problematic. And, of course, then the other elephant in the room uh, that's creating a problem is that we know we have a bunch of tradies uh, currently engaged in some really big projects. Yep. So yep. anything that's got a crane in the sky... Um, and, of course, the reality is those projects are great. We're not anti those projects, uh, but the conditions associated with those projects are very favourable. Uh, they're governed by BPIC principles. And so what's happening so what's is... BPIC, so this is about best practice in construction. Right. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and we're all about safety. We are very much advocates for safety, but... The challenge becomes that when you look at what those best practice conditions look like, the productivity is very low. And so what we're seeing is a group of tradies associated with, with, with those projects. They're getting paid very handsomely. They're, 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 they're getting the benefits of these, uh, of these conditions. And so, of course, they're attracted to those projects. And these are big Big projects, mm. very expensive, large-scale projects. And not all of them are housing And they're either. not housing. No, they're generally not housing. They're, they're, they're the big projects like Queen's Wharf and hospitals, etc. And so then we've got this shortage of tradies um, to do construction of housing. But not only that, not only do we have a shortage, the problem becomes that those conditions are really favourable and you're not able to realistically have those sorts of conditions on a housing on a housing project on yeah. a on a single site housing project, and so what we're seeing is uh, a real slowdown of um, I guess affordable uh, apartments. For example, you're seeing that yes, there's still apartment buildings forging ahead, but as a general rule, they're very high end projects, mm -hmm. multi million dollar apartments at a very high price point. At that affordable end, there's not an enormous amount going on. Um, and so, again, we really need to look at 
productivity? How can we do, how can we ensure that tradies are safe and that the settings are right, the regulatory and legislative settings are right, but that we're not creating a scenario where tradies only want to work on certain projects and, of course, the flow-on effect of that is we're not getting that housing supply that we desperately need. So, so there's a there's a plethora of issues at play. It's not just one single yeah. thing. And of course, it, we're getting the making sure that the, the tradies have those conditions and and that sort of thing as well. We don't want to be increasing the price of new housing builds because that just increases the affordability. Uh, sorry, affordability <laughs> issue yeah. that we're seeing currently. Um, and and on that, it was interesting. You were talking before about just because we're seeing approvals doesn't mean we're seeing builds. That's right. Um, there was some data that I saw. Someone was talking about, it was one of our, our ministers at a federal level talking about one of the largest development companies had had something like 11,000 uh, lots approved and they hadn't turned sod on any of them That's simply right. because there was just there were no tradies. It was the cost of, of construction was too high for the area that it was in and so, so they were sitting on it. At the same time, um, the data the REIQ released around stamp duty back in 2019, there was another study just prior to that. You guys may or may not have referenced it, but the the study prior to that uh, talked about that the red tape and taxes involved in a housing build Mm -hmm. in Australia, and particularly in Brisbane and in Queensland, can equal as much as 36% of the final price of the, the Mm -hmm. property. Mm. Yeah, so we so there's there's uh, obviously REOQ tends not um, we make some commentary about about construction and 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 and, um, and these sorts of issues, but it doesn't fit. Uh, I guess uh, it, it's sort of on the fringes of our jurisdiction, but it's incredibly relevant. Um, so what we know is that in Queensland, uh, there are certain projects that we know sit at around thirty to thirty five percent above the cost of what they would cost outside of Queensland. Um, and, and again, that data has been given to us by, by reliable sources and people wow. who are much closer to it than we are. And, and what we need to understand is that the community often talks about land banking and they become quite critical of, of developers who are land banking. And I, and I acknowledge and understand that frustration when we're seeing people who are homeless and we're seeing the desperation that exists I can understand why people might be inclined to say, well, it shouldn't be permissible to land bank. But the reality is that a developer will not move forward with a project unless it is viable. And at the moment, you've got the challenge of finding the tradies um, to build the thing and then then the price point at which you can sell it. And is there a market there for that? So we know that this is what happens in the marketplace. We know that when you've got... you've got the factors that you need to make a viable, those projects will go ahead. But at the moment, we're seeing a lot of uh, people just sitting on their hands. There's approvals there, but it just doesn't stack up. But if you don't have the people in order to build things, then, you know, it's fine. You could have all the materials that you need, you could have all the approvals, but if you don't have people there in order to construct it... Mm. Yeah, you know, it's going. It's going to sit there. It's going to be yeah. waiting. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm and and interestingly, I I know that just at a personal level, I've spoken to so many people who have gone out, bought a block of land several years ago, and have now made a decision to simply sell it because they're terrified to build. Yeah. Um, because yeah. of course, finding a fixed price contract at the moment is is virtually impossible. Um, there's a lot of fear around the number of uh, insolvencies impacting builders. So people feel really afraid about cost blowouts and potentially will the builder get started and leave me with a partially completed uh, 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 construction site. So these are the sorts of issues that are at play. And some of these are, in some in some cases also, there's a there's a there's a psychological issue associated because because I think. Confidence is key. I don't think anyone mm. wants to go out. It, it's scary enough to build a house uh, or, or to build a, a property, but I think at the moment there's a real lack of confidence around building. Um, so, so that's obviously not helping things also. Which so, would also help when it comes to modular homes because with those mm. they are a lot easier so to speak, to construct as opposed to having 15, 20 odd tradies Mm. there constructing a house, you you don't need as many. That's just played into a question that it's 
popped up purely because of the angle or, or the lines that we've gone down and, and we're talking about. Um, technology as a solution to mm. the, the people problem. We've talked modular housing. Is this where I'm, you're going to start talking? Yeah, about? hold up. Don't, don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. <laughs> i got a feeling I know what's going on. <laughs> I, you might. You might. I mean, look, I'm, I'm seeing it like I'm seeing modular homes, build your own kits pop up mm. in, my, in my feeds on across social media. I've seen container homes popping yeah. up and, and being popular. But the question I really want to ask is, uh, and for your opinion on, and, and maybe you know a little bit more than, than the rest of us on this and, and what the viability could be in Australia, given our, our, our building regulations and so forth, is the 3D printing of homes. Mm. Because the technology there has been around now for, I think we're starting to talk 15 years. Mm. It's improved vastly and there's some incredible builds coming. In fact, on a road trip uh, last December with, with my eldest, Tom, we drove down to Adelaide, we stopped off at uh, Dubbo. Mm-hmm. And they had 3D printed an amenities block there in one of the, um, the Lions oh. Parks. Right. Right. And they're 3D printed. So I sort of got to see it up close and personal. And I can see how it could work. Uh, obviously, an amenities block is vastly different to, to a house. Well, you'd hope so. <laughs> you, you would hope so. I mean, they've got some of the similar features. Yeah. But what, what are your thoughts on that kind of technology coming in and yeah. its impact on potentially solving the supply problem? Yeah, I've always been fascinated by the way that technology can, can solve for this problem. I think... Um, uh, I, I'm surprised that we haven't seen 3D homes. I, I'm surprised that it's still at the, I guess, infancy level that it's still at. Um, I think I think people feel a little bit afraid of this type of non-traditional construction method. Mm. Uh, but, um, I mean, I've been watching shows featuring homes overseas where they've used container homes. Yeah, modular, they do it all. And, and I've often wondered, why don't, why don't we do this well in Australia? So... I think um, I think there's absolutely scope for it. I think part of the challenge is that uh, again, it probably comes back to that red tape issue. Am I going to be allowed to build this or, or construct this? Will it comply with local government requirements and regulations? I think the other issue that we have in Australia is uh, community mentality. I think. In some respects, we're the victims of our own success, if you like, because I think we are, Australians are quite traditional when it comes to what their perception of a home should be. And particularly here in Queensland, we've been, I think, quite slow to embrace apartment living, uh, uh, with the exception of perhaps the Gold Coast, obviously, where apartment living is very common, um, and to a lesser extent, the sunny coast. But if you think about Brisbane, there was a... There's, there's been a, there hasn't been, I don't think we've, we've embraced that type of living. And I think even when we think about, a lot of us think about freestanding homes with a nice big block um, and we think about what we want in our backyard and what we want in our street and in our suburbs. And I think we can be a little bit um, snobby quite frankly, when it comes to what we determine is appropriate. And I think I've had many conversations with politicians about the fact that they need to do more to bring community on the journey, to to shift the mindset. I think we have to understand that we have a growing population. Mm. Uh, You know, by it's a while away, I'll admit that, but by 2070, we're predicted to have a larger population than New South Wales. Now, in order to be ready for that, we've really got to start rethinking and reimagining what homes look like. Mm. We need to stop thinking about enormous five-bedroom houses and four-bedroom houses and that's what everyone wants. That's not what everyone wants. That, that's what some people want. We need to get better at understanding that we, we need to cater for uh, people's differing needs and wants not yeah. everybody can afford a very large home. Mm. Not everybody wants a very large home. So I think we've got to get better at thinking about apartment living because we're not very good at apartment living in Australia. Uh, you know, it's not something, if you, if you think about European countries and Asian countries, they do that much better than we do because it's more commonplace. Mm. Um, and I think we need to start thinking about 
allowing people to build something smaller, allowing multi-generational homes, for example, doing a better job of how we carve up the land, how we utilise all parts of the land. We waste a lot of land because of, again, requirements about setbacks and, and so forth. But all of that involves community coming on the ride because what we find happens is that as human beings... We will sit around a dinner table or around a barbecue and we will all furiously agree that homelessness does not belong in this country, Mm. that every single human being, every Queenslander, every Australian deserves a home. We all agree on that as a principle, but then what happens is often when people become a homeowner, their attitude about what they they want in their street and and in their suburb changes dramatically and all of a sudden... You start to worry about, well, I don't really want an apartment block in my street. I'm worried about the impact that will have on my amenity. I'm worried about the impact it will have on my value. Now, they're all human emotions, but we've really got to do a better job of explaining to the community that our landscape and the way we live needs to change. If we all want our children to be able to one day have shelter, whether they own that shelter or rent it, then it's incumbent upon us to do a better job of, of rethinking mm. what we're building and ensuring that there's enough uh, diversity in our housing to suit our changing needs. Um, and I think that's also part of, of the complexity and the problem. Does that, does that come down to planning? So, and, and a bit of context behind that thinking, if... For example, let's say we go and we look at the suburbs that are closer to Brisbane CBD. So we look at Highgate Hill, Mm. um, we look at Holland Park, these kind of areas, Mm. right, Mornington and so forth. And if they all got rezoned to allow, and and what I mean by that is they go through and they go, hey, this section we're going to rezone and we're going to turn this into an apartment area, Mm. right? And then this section can remain as houses and so forth. The people that have had their property rezoned into an apartment area, most of them, I would wager, would take the opportunity to carve that up, make a profit from it, and then move out further or move where they want to move to if they still want to maintain that larger property. Mm. Otherwise, they may end up staying in the same area, put the cash in the bank, and they end up with an apartment. So is that something that can be driven at the top end down, so from government down, where government starts to go, you know what, we're now going to rezone, replan, you don't have to carve your property up and turn it into an apartment building, but you now have the ability to with streamlined remove red tape because it's already rezoned. And if that's what you want to do and you want to cash in and, and move further out, then you can. Mm. Is that something that would yeah. help that in your opinion? Look, and again, uh, I don't pretend to be an expert when it comes to, to town planning matters, but I think what we need to accept, it's not about creating an entire suburb that is nothing other than apartment complexes. Mm. Um I know that, that that's probably too extreme. Yeah, not, not a suburb, but like going, hey, let's designate about, this area. Yeah, or, it's yeah. about, look, we, we've got some land available here. We could we could probably quite easily put something in that's maybe uh, six floors, for example. We're yeah. not talking about, you know... Skyscrapers. F- f- skyscrapers in the middle of our suburbs. We've yeah. got to be realistic about this. So it, there's practical issues like just bin collection day, for example, and, and parking and things like mm. this. But again, I think... What I'd love to see is government and private industry working more closely together because I think there probably are people who are sitting on parcels of land today, now, and they don't even understand what its development potential is or what its development potential could be if they went through certain channels, for example. So I think there's an opportunity for... There's probably people living... Empty nesters, for example, living in properties that could be converted into something that is, uh, that, that, that is multi-dwelling in nature and could house many more people and probably also solves for their problem, which is probably that I'm sitting in this five-bedroom house as an empty nester and it's all a bit terrifying and daunting. And by the way, I don't really want to go out and buy something else in a whole new area where I don't have my network of friends and connections. And so I think there's a real opportunity to kind of almost create this matchmaker system, if you like, where a a developer or a builder could come along and say, hey, let us work with you to develop this. 
Uh, and so, again, I think it's really about all levels of government, the community getting involved, and then private sector getting involved. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a multi-pronged, um, uh, I think, uh, solution. You know what? You've put that out into the universe now, so there's a really good chance because I happen to know a couple of people that, with the right support, would love to engage with that. Yeah. So I will be sending this episode to... Uh, there's a couple <laughs> of people who have immediately jumped to mind... Uh, one in particular is is a good mate who works in a company where they they use data and things like Google Maps and, and that sort of data to then analyse properties and create development potential workups like vi- viability studies yeah. and things like that. So them partnered with potentially their key developer, builder and so forth could absolutely assist in this kind of scenario where they're going to homeowners and saying, hey, would you like to know what the development potential of your property is, obligation-free, not going to cost you anything, but it'll give you an idea of what you can do so that you don't have to move out of the area. That's you know, right. Or, or manage a Probably house make that's too big. some good money off of it and then you get to have a new dwelling and stay in the area that you're familiar with that's, yeah. that's, that's perhaps a more suitable size for that stage of life. Uh, you've made some money. You, you, you've allowed for the, the 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 plot to be used to house multiple people and families. It's it's a sounds, win-win. It, yeah, it sounds like a win for everybody, mm. which and and a win for Queensland and, and Australia as a whole. Because mm. if it you set the example, then other states will follow mm. to solve the same well, problem because everyone's other, having the same problem. The other thing that we had come across uh, it was a f- quite a few episodes ago was uh, that little, um, I think it was Victoria that they were in, where it was the, this little country council? town. Yeah, had yeah. actually had, like the council had bits of land mm. and uh, they had someone come and were like, yep, 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 we'll do it. And then nothing ended up happening. So what the council did is they took it on and they actually put the money into they building. They developer. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, so they actually developed, I think it was... 172 lots in yeah. the first round. They were about two hours out of Melbourne by train, but they were on the direct train route. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. And they they sold out in good time. Like mm. it was like 18 months, two years kind of thing. So yeah. it wasn't wow. like a 10-year project. They sold out fairly quickly. Uh, and they're about. They were about to release new land when we looked at the episode. Yeah, we and it. so it ended up because they were like, you know, we needed people to come because our population of our town was starting to get really small. We needed more people, so we built it, and they came. And so they've released yeah, more land, and they I think it's another. I want to say sixty three ha- like houses that they're potentially going to build. In yeah, the next there's, release, there's, there's it's quite stage. a significant. It might and have been sixty three in the first and one hundred and seventy two in the second, maybe. Uh, maybe either way, and they've actually had quite a number of people who they wouldn't have originally had moved to the town that are just like, yeah, we actually prefer it. We've actually got friends coming right. and wanting to move yeah. here. What a great, what a great story! And I think the interesting thing about that is probably pre COVID, I dare say, mm. that would have been a really different outcome because Mm. I think what's happened is, you know, one of the, dare I say, the silver linings of the pandemic is the introduction of the hybrid working uh, life or or indeed. Because there's no need now to work, to live 15 minutes away. And and that's it. They they were already sitting in traffic. A lot of them, a lot of the comments were, we were already sitting in traffic 90 minutes and we were paying a fortune to live, you know, supposedly 30 minutes from the CBD. Yeah, but just Um, sitting in the car. You sit in the car that whole time. I said, so we don't mind sitting for an hour and 55 minutes, but owning our own home, sitting on the train Mm. for an hour, because we can work while we're on the train, we can do our thing. And it's interesting because Saul is actually looking at changing jobs. So really good friend of ours, um, his brother from another mother kind of kind of deal. He works over in WA uh, in the councils <coughs> and is a, a, a rates adjuster and so forth. And he's looking at, at moving roles. And the role he's looking at going to would actually require him to do somewhere in the vicinity of about four hours travel each way per day. And so part of his negotiation isn't actually about money. It's if you give me two days a week work from home, I will eat the travel on the other three days because that just works better for my life and how I want to live my life and spend time with my kids and so forth. And those kind of negotiations are happening more and more. I'm hearing more and more stories from people ab- about that. It's mm. it's more about the yeah. another mate of mine negotiated, said they, they offered him more money, said, I don't want the money. 
but why don't you give me X amount of time additional off per month as long as I hit certain KPIs instead of that extra money? Mm. And they went, okay, no worries. So he gets like an extra two days a month off uh, as long as he hits his KPIs he hasn't missed. I think we are all really valuing that quality of life so much more post... Well, I don't know that I should be saying post-COVID because I guess we're still in the throes of the thing, but... I, I do we think what, we, much, what we, we value has really changed. Yeah. And yeah. I think the ability to have that flexibility around the way we work and where we're situated when we work. Um, and that's really interesting because I think we often assume it's all about the dollars and that's all that people rate. And I think money's important, of course, but I, I do think I'm seeing more and more people saying, my time is precious. My time with yeah. my kids, my time with my partner, my time for myself is really valuable to me and, and that becomes um, re- really evident. But I think it's, I think it's a, it, it, it makes a difference when it comes to housing as well. Mm. I think it just allows you to think outside of the box about where you can live. Mm. And uh, we know that as a general rule, when you go further afield from the city centre, it gets cheaper. And, um, and I think now people are prepared to look at those options, uh, even though it does mean more travel time, mm. because it means a more affordable price point, and they're not necessarily having to do that commute on a daily basis. Yeah. 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 Well, people are wanting to work to live as opposed to live to work, yeah. and that's, that's right. what everyone wants. Because, I mean... They, it's all well and good to go find a job at, that you enjoy because it, then it's a hobby for you, and, and it's like, well, you can still you can still have that if you actually had that time to be able to yeah. spend with family, friends, and yeah. actually make it so that it's like, cool, I can actually tolerate going to the office. <laughs> I can tolerate that three days a week. Because I've got my two days a week yeah. to actually be that participant within the family. Yeah. 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 Look, on, on that, obviously there's a fair bit happening in housing at the present point in time at a government level. You're in a seat that is, is very, very privileged in the sense that you get to see a lot more before we do. Yeah. And, and you probably get to see the intent more than just the announcements that the general public get yeah. to see. What is it that's coming or that is already in place that concerns you, that, that should concern homeowners, renters, tenants, everybody across the board? And is there anything that actually gives you hope as well? Yeah, I think one of the things that concerns me is, and it's more around what they're not saying, uh, there seems to be a real lack of focus around home ownership in Queensland. I think there's very little in terms of, for the aspirational homeowner, there doesn't seem to be those pathways. We know that uh, there are some stamp duty concessions for first home buyers. They pretty much uh, cut out at 500000 When we look at the median <laughs> price, it becomes redundant. So there, there's that. We really need to look at uh, raising that, that, that stamp duty threshold for first home owners and stamp duty thresholds more generally in terms of what, what, um, what stamp duty is payable and at what rate. I think we've also got to, um, and so I think we've got to do more to support those who would like to buy um, and to bring back the hope and the aspiration of home ownership. Uh, it, then when we look at rental, um, at the rental situation, as I already mentioned earlier in the show, we have one of the highest, if not the highest, rental population in the country uh, here in Queensland. And that's, I'm not making a statement about renting being bad. That's not what it's about. But what we are seeing is that the number of people who rent in Queensland is on the rise. And the challenge that we have is that we have a government um, that over the last five years has been very much exclusively focused on developing a legislative and regulatory setting and framework that is very centred and focused on tenant protection and tenant security. Now, it's really important that those frameworks are fair and balanced. Tenants absolutely need certain statutory protections and rights. Mm. So we're not suggesting let's have a system that completely favours the property owner, but equally what we need is fair, balanced laws because it's important to understand that 
if you keep legislating in a way as this government has been, so we've had five rounds of legislative reform in the last five years. Wow. And when you look at what those reforms have been, it's fair to say that they have been entirely focused on giving tenants greater rights and reducing the rights of property owners and and effectively coming in over the top of their contractual relationship and in some respects binding the hands of the property owner behind their back and saying we're going to stop you from being able to make certain decisions in respect of the property that you own. Now the challenge becomes that though that rental market, that those 36% of our population who rent, the vast majority of those people are renting homes from private investors. And I I, I really dislike the term mum and dad investors, but everyday Australian investors, let's yeah. call them that. Mm. I think that's a more appropriate way of referring to them. And around 92%, I think, of those properties come from private, everyday Australians mm. who own, as a general rule, one investment property. And so we've got to make sure that there's a balance there. So instead of us sending a message to those property owners that you are bad people, you are greedy people, you are... There's some people in our community who have decided that if you're a property investor, you're an evil person. Now, I think we have to be realistic about how this this works. These are the people who are providing the vast majority of properties for our rental population. Mm. If the government wishes to step in and undertake that task, then so be it. But we know that that's not what's happening. (laughs) Here in Queensland, we have a social housing wait list of around 50,000 and it's growing. And so what we've got at the moment is people who belong in social housing, the most vulnerable in our community, are trapped in the private rental market. Now, that's problematic, okay? Mm. And so what's happening is... Often we're hearing these really dreadful stories, tenant experiences that are really negative and really bad. Um, we wouldn't and, know anything and about what that, happens, would we? And what happens is then you've got a government who comes along and looks at perhaps the experience of a, a cohort or a section of our community and then they say, all property owners are bad, we need to legislate. Mm. Uh, all tenants have this experience and we need to create protections. And so, you know, that concerns me, this this constant, um, I guess, uh, vilification of property owners and also uh, really just the constant tinkering of rental legislation and the erosion of the balance that should be there. That That's problematic. I Absolutely, and I agree with that. From your point of view, what have you seen has been the impact of that vilification? Because you, you talk about it for five years and it's, it's absolutely ramped up in the last five years that the narrative out of the government has been that investors are bad, right? They're greedy, they're evil, they're all the bad things and, and that's been then carried with the media and, of course, tenants have, have started to feel that way themselves. And, of course, any tenant who's had even a remotely bad experience yeah. starts to go oh, and, and starts of to buy, buy into it. But what has been the impact on the market that you've seen this narrative has, has afflicted? It's, it's always such a difficult question to answer, and I always want to be careful not to sound hysterical. Yeah. And it's really hard to find firm data around this. Mm. Um, so, so to begin with, I will say in Queensland at the moment, uh, what we do know is that the number of people who are investors who are buying is actually on the rise, okay. which is really interesting. Mm. What we don't know is who are they buying from. Yeah. Are they buying from investors who have said, this is all too hard, I'm out? Yeah. Or are they buying from owner-occupiers who might be moving to a new property? So we don't know enough about that. Look, anecdotally... We know, and I get lots of correspondence from property owners, there is no doubt in my mind that the legislative reform agenda over the last few years has driven away some investors. Now, I don't have firm figures around how many, but certainly when I talk to uh, uh, real estate owners, they will tell us that their rent roll has diminished considerably, that they've had a number of their investors say uh, when the tenancy is up, don't renew, we're going to be selling, it's all too hard. 
So we do hear those stories. I don't have firm numbers around what that looks like, but there's definitely a sentiment out there. Um, and I think we're seeing it. It plays out on social media as well. Mm. It's, it's, it's there for all the world to see. You, you watch a show and it becomes this us and them mentality. Mm. And I, I think that's really sad. Now, that's not to say I've been a tenant many times over my years. I've had some really dreadful experiences. Uh, so I'm not pretending that there are, sometimes you do have a negative experience as a tenant, but what I will say, and, and sometimes you'll get a very bad property owner or a bad property manager. We're not suggesting that that there's perfection out there, but let's be honest, we also know that sometimes tenants don't behave particularly well as, as well. What we know, though, is we've got about 650,000 Queenslanders renting. We know that the vast majority are in good, positive relationships with their property owners. You know, I heard lots of really wonderful stories during COVID where even before the laws were made around uh, the COVID eviction moratorium laws, where property owners were just reaching out directly to tenants or reaching out to property managers to say, hey, if, they, if they've lost their job or if they're impacted by COVID, let's give them, let's give them a break. Mm. So, so there's a lot of really goodwill there. Now, I think the challenge over the last few years has been because there's been constant legislative change, every time that legislative change occurs, it's surrounded with an announcement about we're doing this because tenants need to be protected by terrible... Yeah. You, you know, so it's around the narrative that I think is concerning. It's about language really matters when it comes to this. And it's the same reason why we've also seen this exodus, massive exodus of property managers who have just decided it's it's all too hard. Mm. Mm. We're sick of being labelled dodgy and bad. Now, I, whenever I talk about this, I'm always conscious that if a tenant is listening to me and they've had a really negative experience, it's really easy for them to be cynical about what I'm saying. But Really, what the REIQ is about is fair, balanced laws. You know, we actually do care about tenants. We've been involved in a range of initiatives and programs over the years that are all about tenant protection. Mm. We need tenants in our community. Mm. Uh, Our community relies on tenants. So um, we're not saying it's not about good and bad. Um, and we're not going to be Pollyanna about it and say every property manager is great or every property owner is great. We know that they're shades of grey. I'm always disappointed when I see a story that hits the press about a property manager or a property owner behaving badly. That actually really upsets me. Mm. As the CEO mm. of this peak body, I think, come on, we should be doing better. You know, as a community at the moment, the rental crisis is real. You know, can you imagine the strain and the stress of lining up with 50 other people and knowing that your odds are pretty bad? Yeah. And doing that and you know your tenancy is coming to an end and you're trying to find a new home for your kids. Oh, that that's that's it's I terrifying. don't know that it gets much more serious than yeah. that. So I want to be really respectful and say I acknowledge how stressful that is on tenants. But what the government's doing, I think, is diverting attention. Let's create more legislative change and let's create more legislative reform, let's, but let's avoid what's actually at play here, which is a supply like problem. we're doing something well, while this not is actually the thing, fixing the problem. Well, what we know is historically when we've got good, when we've got healthy vacancy rates, when we're sitting in that 26 to 3.5% vacancy rate I mentioned earlier, when, when we're there, what we know, and, and this, is, this is based on fact, we know that rents tend to stay stable, we know that tenants have greater negotiating power, we know that generally those relationships are more positive. So if we can get back to focusing on how are we going to get more rental supply into the market and then how do we make sure we've got really good, fair, balanced laws so that more people want to be investing in Queensland property to provide homes for renters, mm. that's, that's the magic formula. So, yeah. all right, you've touched on that. If I happened to hand you Aladdin's magic lamp and you got to rub it and the genie came out and gave you three wishes, how would Antonia fix that to ensure that we went back to having, or not back to, but we had fair and balanced laws that took into account the current market and the challenges in that place. Uh, 
so that everybody, not everybody wins, but not everybody loses. It's that, that compromise, right? Everybody gives a little, everybody gets a lot. Yeah, look, I think... I think the government underestimates the ability of people to, to come to their own contractual wishes. Mm. You know, this kind of cookie-cutter method of tenancy law. I get it to some extent. I totally appreciate that there will be some tenants, inevitably, sadly, who don't have the same level of negotiating power. And so what we've always said to government is you've actually got to throw your arms around the most vulnerable in our community and do more to Mm. protect those people. So instead of coming along and trying to create a legislative framework that really is designed for them, what you should be doing is providing extra support for that group and then creating a legislative framework that works better for everyone. Mm. Um, And so that might mean providing uh, subsidies to sustain tenancies. It might involve, uh, you know, greater levels of support and information. We know that the government funds the Tenants Union or Tenants Queensland, you know, to the tune of many millions of dollars. Again, that is exclusively for tenants. So all of those things we accept and understand. Um, I think back to your question, though, about what would we wind back That's a tough one about how do you wind this stuff back. It's very difficult to wind it back. But I think the things that probably have caused the most significant concern over the years have been things like making it virtually impossible. Well, making it actually impossible to just say no to pets, for example. I know that that was a really controversial issue. And our position on that has always been... You actually need to do more to encourage property owners to say yes to pets because by default, most property owners do want to say no to pets. And what we know is that pets are so important to so many Mm. people in our community and there's so many benefits that come with having a pet for elderly people, for children, for for people who might have um, certain special needs, for example. So what we've said is things like instead of creating legislation that says As a property owner, you don't get a choice anymore. You don't just get to say no. Why don't you create a framework that is actually designed to actually encourage a property owner to say yes? So that might be things like allowing for a pet bond that is, uh, for example, appropriately designed for the the pet. Mm. So if it's a little chihuahua versus a 10, well, you know, a a 30 kilo great. Yeah, (laughs) I don't know my dog breeds very well. That pet bond might vary depending on the level of risk associated. And again... But maybe even factoring in that that particular pet is actually registered to the local count, to that council as well. So that also means that at least then, you know, it has happened to us where... (laughs) <laughs> our, our little staffy, little Lulu, did a runner. Yeah, came became very well acquainted with the next door neighbour. <laughs> gave her, you know, bath treats, the whole deal. Um, mm-hmm. But having that so that at least then people automatically go, oh, there's an animal here that we don't know where it belongs. Let's take it to the local vet, get them to be scanned, yeah. or get them to look them up so that they can try and find. The actual but I think that also well. indicates responsibility as a pet owner. Yeah. yeah. That well, if you've done that, you're paying some money, you've done the right thing, yeah. you understand that dog ownership comes with certain responsibilities. Yeah. So, so I think it's, for me, it's about the Act is so prescriptive and you can't contract out of the Act. Yeah. So that is a good example of one where why not allow a little bit more flexibility mm. it, it, to allow the parties to say, well, what suits us in this relationship? Mm then you'll probably find that tenancies would go for longer, you know, the the length of tenancies would go for longer. Um, And I think you'd find that, again, uh, it's about treating people like adults and allowing them to negotiate the terms of their tenancy agreement that suits them a little bit more. Mm. And I think really now a lot of that freedom to contract has been greatly constrained. Well, it comes back down to community, though. If you act like a community when it comes to, you know, like let's do the – like I understand that that's your need and that's your want. This is what I am wanting and needing. Like let's talk about this. Mm. Let's come together as a community as opposed to having that whole us and them mentality. So on that, as a great point. Has the government become a victim of its own narrative 
in the sense that you know five years ago they really ramped up the investors are bad and and property you know property owners are bad and so forth mentality and, and that narrative and and they kind of were the source of it really from everything that we could see have they now looking at the legislation that they're they're trying to put in bought into that forgot that they were the ones that started pumping it out and bought into it and have gone you know what you guys can't be trusted so we're taking all your toys away and you're just going to play with what we give you yeah it's look it's hard to know where it all started look to be to be to be fair it's not just queensland there's been tenancy reform sweeping mm. the nation um we obviously saw it um kick off in particular with the COVID eviction moratorium yep. laws, now obviously extraordinary circumstances at the heart of the pandemic. And then since then, what we've seen is we did see National Cabinet come out not so long ago and say, here's the blueprint for how tenancy laws should look. Now, we were already there as a state. Our laws had already changed to meet well, the majority of our laws had already changed to meet that national blueprint. So that is rolling out across the country. But it's really interesting because, you know, I, again, on social media, you switch on the telly and you watch a show where renting is being discussed and it is very much this us and them. Mm. Um, now, to some extent, there's always been a little bit of that, but I don't ever recall, you know, I've, I've been working in REI environment now for 20 plus years because I started with uh, Real Estate Institute of South Australia. I don't recall a time when it's been like it is now, this, mm. this kind of us versus them, that that anger, the kind of vitriol around it, the you know, and and it's that shortage issue, and of course, rent increase issues. Oh yeah. Um, yep. Now, yeah, again, we acknowledge that rents have gone up considerably, particularly here in Queensland, but again, when we look at the historical numbers, rent has moved at a very very rapid at a very modest pace rather in Queensland, and then of course. COVID, we've seen this very rapid rise mm. in rents. Mm. Um, and so that sort of very simplistic view that, oh, well, it's property owners just trying to exploit the situation. There will be some who are, whether you want to call it exploiting or leveraging the tight rental market, yes, there will be some who are just saying, well, I can charge more and therefore I will. But what it doesn't contemplate is the number of people who have actually bought those investment properties at the height of the market. Mm. Because sometimes what happens is you'll have someone who's owned a property 10, 20, 30 years, they sell it, they've got the capital gain on it, presumably, and then someone comes along and buys it at today's market rate. So what it was rented for previously and what it can be rented for now, they're two very different things. Yeah, that yeah. new owner it's probably not going to be sustainable for them to rent it out at what the previous owner who held it and probably had paid it off was able to offer. So so it really ignores all of those different shades of grey stories. But also, I know a number of property owners, a number of property owners who are very decent people, very decent people, who have said, you know, my interest rates have skyrocketed, in some cases doubled, um, and, you know, I actually feel really bad, but I've got to, I've got to increase mm. the rent. You know, I think there's this perception that they're all greedy. They're, 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 you know, rubbing their hands with glee because they can make more money. As a general rule, once you've had a tenant in and you've formed a relationship, it doesn't give you great joy to have to increase the rent. It just becomes, here, here's my expenses, my council rates, my insurance. Mm. You know, and, and I mean, there's data available on this in terms of, yes, rents have gone up, but when you compare that to the cost of holding the property, that's actually gone up at a far more significant rate yeah. than what rents have. And so, again, I just think when we talk about these issues, it's really important that we, we actually do look at the facts and the information because I think what happens is it becomes such an emotive issue and it becomes really easy to just become very black and white and take a side. And, um, and I think that's a dangerous sport. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a very nuanced discussion. And I think that nuanced discussions are something that we're kind of losing 
in the current soundbite world and, and the way the media is yeah. operating and particularly chasing headlines, chasing soundbites, social media's, you know, 30 to 60 seconds of attention. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult to converse a nuanced point uh, or convey a nuanced point in 30 to 60 seconds. It, it, it is in virtually impossible and that, that, that's, a, that's a challenge we have on a daily basis. How do you come out and comment on something in a meaningful way when the, 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 the span of attention is so limited? Um, and it's, a, it's an ongoing issue and it, it feels like it's getting worse. Oh, look, I'd agree with you and, and working in social media, absolutely. On that, you, you obviously as the REIQ, you have a lot of fingers and a lot of pies working with the community, representing all sides of, of the market. Mm. What is it and, and how are you guys progressing in this world where we do have a housing crisis, we've got a rental crisis, we've got uh, a soundbite-driven kind of media uh, and social media. How are you working to restore trust in the industry as a whole? So we're doing a well. We're doing a number of things. One of the one of the things we've recently started to do, which I'm really proud of, is we've started to produce a video series called Prop IQ. Uh, our first episode is about first home buyers giving information and tips and practical information for those who are wanting to buy for the first time. Um, and the second one is about renting and talking about how rental relationships work, how laws work around renting. Um, and then we've got a third one that's uh, due to hit shortly about buying at auction and the auction process. So, where, where is this being released? Where can people? Find uh, so, it? They, so people can watch it on our social media channels. It comes out live on Facebook, and then we have it on our social media channels. If you type in Prop IQ, uh, you'll find it. And I'm really proud of it. Um, the production quality is excellent. I think the content is really, really useful. Um, on top of that, we do an enormous amount of our time gets dedicated to actually educating the community. So we'll do that through things like media releases, which get picked up by print media. We'll go on radio or on TV and we'll talk about, we try, we really pride ourselves on giving accurate information and sticking to the facts. Um, that is incredibly important. We're 106 years old. I believe we're a trusted brand. I take that very seriously. So we often get asked to predict things and I'm very hesitant to ever predict anything. Crystal ball gazing is always <laughs> dangerous. So we always try and whenever we comment on something, we try and substantiate everything we say with data. Um, so, so that sort of communication piece through media uh, with the community I think is really important. And then I'm really proud of the work we do. We work with a bunch of different stakeholders on lots of really great initiatives. I'm personally an ambassador of the Forgotten Women, which is an initiative that is specifically geared towards housing women over the age of 55 who are homeless. Um, and we work closely with the Priority Project, which is a, a, a housing initiative that is specifically catering for providing housing for women who have uh, experienced domestic and family violence. We work closely with Tenancy Skills Institute. Uh, they provide education to prospective tenants and they also do some great work in terms of tenancy sust sustainment. And in all of those projects, uh, people from the REIQ and real estate agents are involved in those projects. And I think those projects, I think really, and those initiatives, and, there's, there's, and that's only a handful of them, we spend an enormous amount of time on projects and programs that are social, they, I would call them social justice projects, mm. uh, because we are committed to the Queensland community. Yes, we are the real estate peak body, and as such, we represent real estate practitioners. But ultimately, our goal as the peak body is to ensure that everybody can participate in a real estate transaction in a positive way, that people can make informed decisions about renting their property, buying their property, selling their property, etc. So that for us, that trust is incredibly important. And then finally, I think we also have a, 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 one of the ways we, 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 we ensure that that trust is there is through the people who are our members, who choose to be members of the Real Estate Institute of Queensland. We are constantly providing them education, communication. We keep them up to date with what's coming, with what's changing. We've developed best practice guidelines 
It's really about us trying to give the tools, the information to our members to say, we're going to give you all of this so that you can be up to date, you can be compliant, you can be ethical, and you can act in a way that mirrors the best practice uh, guidelines that REIQ uh, has developed. And I think, you know, that's important because if you choose to be a member of the REIQ, we make your life harder. It costs some money, not much, but it does cost money. And and there's a requirement to undertake annual professional development. So we actually do make it harder. So as a general rule, if people have chosen to be a member of the REIQ, it speaks to their commitment to their profession and I think it speaks to their commitment to the Queensland community. You know, you've, you've asked a question that I've got scheduled for a little bit later there, but I think you've asked it absolutely perfectly. And I was going to say, well, why, why should people preference working with an REIQ member agent, but you've answered it beautifully there and, and really what it comes down to is someone who chooses to be a member of the REIQ, because it's not compulsory, mm. so if they choose to be a member of the REIQ, you guys do make them jump through extra yeah. hoops and, and actually prove their mettle and consistently improve on that as well, which I think demonstrates a dedication to doing things the right way and to their career as well as their clients that someone who's not going to have that mentality will look at what those requirements of being an REIQ member are and will choose not to. Well, I'll I'll add to that and say that we know uh, it's been a while since we've done this analysis, but we've done it in the past when we look at uh, those real estate agents and agencies who are prosecuted by the Office of Fair Trading, we know that statistically our members fare really well. Yeah. Uh, that they are usually non-members who are getting into strife with the regulator. And and I don't say that in a nasty way, but it stands to reason that that's happening if you think about it because our members are attending our events. They're getting trained. They're getting regular education. They've made a commitment to keep their knowledge up to date. And often non-compliance is generally the result of ignorance. Sometimes people will behave in a fraudulent manner and quite intentionally break the law, but usually it's because of ignorance. And so I think our members are, as a general rule, better educated because we are, every fortnight, we bombard them, (laughs) sometimes daily, with news and information. And I actually don't know how non-members keep up. Um, because it is such a fast-moving landscape. To, to be honest, I don't think they'd be aware anywhere near as much, simply because uh, having been part of different membership bodies and then it's delivered, mm. to suddenly you're in a black hole. And I think you don't notice what you don't have. That's right. Like you don't notice it's missing, but you notice when it's there. Yeah. And I think that's that's the huge thing. So there's probably a lot of uh, people that are, you know believe they're operating ethically, out there in the marketplace, but because of changes, they're not even aware that those changes have happened yeah. because no matter how much the government will put out, no matter how much you guys put out, no matter how much it'll be on the news, there's always going to be people slipping through the cracks who yeah. just don't see it because yeah. the cycle, the news cycle moves so quickly yeah. and the, the information cycle moves so quickly that by the time it's next week, it's already moved on to another thing. But the other thing too is that there is a lot of professions out there where being part of of a you know a, a body where it's education and things like that um there's a lot out there that do that anyway so it's not like you're making their life harder if anything well, you're the, actually the, keeping them up to date with what they should know yeah the, the difference here is that in real estate it's not compulsory like in in legal profession there's compulsory bodies and so on and so forth in real estate it's not and i think Antonio would probably agree with me that that needs to change. Everyone needs to be a member Look, of the REIQ. there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I've got, a fun, I've got a, uh, an interesting position on this. I've often had people say to me over these, oh, you would really love it if there was legislation that mandated that every real estate practitioner, that they didn't have a choice but to be your member. And I'm not sure that I would love that. I don't want to hold people to ransom. I don't want to blackmail someone to be our member. I want, I want people who are committed to their profession that they make a they make a an informed effort. and conscious decision that I want to be because it's about it's about it's about the recognition that I need to join a body that's going to keep me informed and keep me working to the highest standard 
And so I want people who are members for that reason mm. because they're committed to their profession and they're committed to the community and they care about the work that they do. Mm. And um, so I don't know how I would feel. I mean, look, of course, it would be nice if you could wave your wand and and everyone had to be a member, but I, I don't know. I think... I think the calibre of our membership would probably change if, if it was mandatory to be a member. I think that is the best advertisement for why should you work with an REIQ no. member agent that I have ever heard. Well, I mean, when it's, it comes, it, it's people's biggest investment in their life or one of. So mm. why would you not want to have someone who's up to date with things acting on your behalf? Like, yeah. why oh, wouldn't you? 100%. I, I wouldn't dream of... Um, you know, I think I think when you consider what real estate professionals do, I, I, I mean, I'm going to get on my on my soapbox <laughs> about. This, I didn't bring mine in, but no, uh, like, let's right. pretend there's one here. I'll pretend. And, um, and once you finish, I'll ask you about stamp duty so I can get on. My <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I just think it really does. It actually blows my mind when I think about the work that real estate professionals perform. I don't know that there's really too many others doing work that is as important. And the reason I say that is because you're entrusting someone to sell what is, for most of us, our most valuable asset. Mm. And you're Mm. saying, please step into my shoes and act for me and sell my most valuable asset, Mm. which in some cases is your family home. Not Mm. always. Sometimes it's an investment. And then equally, that agent is going out and negotiating and talking to prospective buyers who want to buy this thing. And I think, gosh, or, or and similarly with a rental property. You know, it's about shelter. I don't know that it gets much more serious than that in mm. terms of, you know, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy. You know, shelter is so imperative for, for a range of reasons. We know that. And so I think... It's 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 really important work, and then if you think about trust accounts, the potentially millions of dollars that sit in a trust account, mm. it, it 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 actually it is such important work, and it's um and 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 you know the law recognises the significance of it. The law says it's a fiduciary relationship. You know, a fiduciary relationship. There's very few of them. You know, there's there's lawyer and client patient and doctor, real estate agent and client. Mm. It, it's in that set. The law says it's a fiduciary relationship. So so if you think about those other fiduciary relationships, medical practitioner and, and, and the relationship you have with a lawyer, you know, that's the way we should be seeing ourselves. The law puts us in that category and therefore we should absolutely take this seriously and be committed to, to to education and to our clients and to the community. <coughs> Excuse me. I did warn I, you about getting out no, of you're right. I'm, I'm impressed that like we're, we're an <coughs> hour and eight minutes in and, and you're still going, the voice hasn't cracked. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it might it's, be starting. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Like, but I, th- I think, you know, what you're talking about there is, is vitally important and I think maybe that underlies some of the ease with which it, it – the media, I guess, but also just the community as a whole has been able to feel aggrieved by real estate agents and the stories that they hear, hear whether it's property managers, sales agents, whether you're buying, selling and so forth, is I think instinctively they, at least for the market, maybe not the agents, but for the market, they understand that this is the kind of relationship that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And if, if the agent falls short of that relationship, that is always going to leave a sour taste in, in their mouth. Like Absolutely. if you think about... We've all been to a doctor where we've gone, that wasn't right. <laughs> Something's wrong yeah. there. You're like, that That guy does it. That, that doctor doesn't mm. know what they're talking about. Mm. They've. I feel like I've been 15 minute in, you know, run through a textbook Pointless exercise, exercise yeah. and been written, given a script that's actually not relevant to what or I'm not feeling. not even given or, a script. Just take yeah. some Panadol, you'll be fine. Take some Panadol, you'll be fine. Meanwhile, right, so you're dying in bed. <laughs> we've all felt that, right? How many of us have gone back to that doctor? Like, I haven't. And, and I'm willing to bet the majority have. And and with lawyers, it's the same again. Like if, if we have a lawyer that we don't feel we trust, like if we're employing a lawyer, we're doing it because there's some serious shenanigans going on, right? Like no matter which side of it you're on. Uh, and we'll fire that lawyer in a heartbeat if we don't, or we won't even hire them if we don't get the right feeling. Mm. And and it's, 
you know, putting in that perspective that you've just sort of put it in, uh, with real estate agents, it's it kind of makes it understandable why those those who have had such a bad experience and those who have even had a mediocre experience where they're like, yeah, look, we we got what we feel was a good price for the property. We don't feel the agent was telling us the truth all the time, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Why they would also sort of feel that they fit in that camp mm. uh, and, and that trust would be so heavily impacted. And I think that that level of professionalism is vitally important moving forward because it's going to tinge the relationship. So... On that, what what are you guys doing for your members to ensure that their level of professionalism continues to increase and is unchallenged? Yeah, I think one of the uh, – last year we produced uh, a set of best practice guidelines and what we did is it, we, we developed these guidelines for each specific sector. So there's a set of guidelines for salespeople, set of guidelines for property managers, business brokers, auctioneers, et cetera, et cetera, commercial – so really what they're about is we often have this debate about is our role is, un, is misunderstood. People think we're the regulator and that we can get a big stick out. We're not the regulator. We have no statutory uh, authority in Queensland. Um, and so we decided last year that actually we want to encourage the right behaviour. It should be carrot, not stick. And ultimately, we don't have a stick to yield anyway, even if we wanted to. And, um, and so what we did is we got together with our sales chapter and all of the various chapters that, that represent those different sectors and we said, let's come up with a set of guidelines that is the gold standard, that we say, th- this is what you should be doing each and every time. And then the idea is we will revisit those on a regular basis to make sure that we keep up to date and we're adapting them to, to reflect changing uh, environments. So we've done that. Obviously, with a lot of our training, we focus on how can you be a better real estate agent? And that means sometimes our training's not that sexy, right? Like, but there's not a shortage of training out there, the rah-rah training, as I call it. So our training is about how can you be a better communicator? How can you make sure that you're, you're compliant? How can you make sure that when you do a Form 6, it's correct? How can you make sure that you're not engaging in misleading and deceptive conduct? How can you build trust with your client? So we tend to focus our training on those sorts of things. And it really comes down to um, what what do we value? What are the things that we value? You know, we'll do things like we'll put together, uh, a few years ago, we put together an inaugural leadership retreat. And that was to try and develop better real estate business leaders. So it starts from the top. So again, they're all little things that we do, but collectively we hope that what we're doing is we're actually raising the bar and raising the level of professionalism and the level of care that exists in real estate. And, and, you know, this is what frustrates me because I know that there are so many decent human beings working in real estate. I know them. They're great property managers you know, they're great salespeople. But unfortunately, they're not the ones who get the attention and the limelight. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is you get the stories about the really bad conduct mm. or you get the stories about the agents that are raking it in. Yeah. Now, I don't begrudge people making lots of money. You can make lots of money in real estate, potentially. But again, it's about... What the public often sees is either the, um, the unscrupulous real estate agent who's engaging in pa- bad behaviour or the real estate agent who's making more than the heart surgeon, in which case people are like, why is a real estate agent making all that money and why are they driving those fast European cars? And th- those are the two things that tend to be focused on in the media. I'm interested in the bit in the middle, which are the real estate agents who are waking up day in, day out and just doing a really great job for their Mm. clients and who really, really care about their clients. The the human beings who sell houses. Yeah, or or rent houses out. Yeah. You know, and and these are people who, I know them, they go above and beyond. Um, And they're really good people who care and I guess they're not, 
their stories aren't aren't exciting enough to end up in the media, right? So even before, earlier today, I was talking to my chairman and we were talking about this very issue and we both said, we've got to do a better job as a peak body of singing the praises of those people. Absolutely, yeah. We can recommend one agent. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's mess- tried to call <laughs> you and she's messaged me. Uh, while we're here. While I'm we're even here. said, I'm in, an, I'm in a podcast with the REIQ <laughs> CEO and she, she's still trying. Maybe she wants to call in and just be like, so, question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she's, she's awesome. But, no, you're right. Like, there's and one of the points that we make is there's no more bad actors in real estate than there are in any other industry. Mm-hmm. It's just because it's so emotionally charged, it makes great headlines. Yeah. Um, and I think that if, if you guys can find a way, and I know that you guys walk a, a tightrope, if you will, because you can't be seen to be favouring any member agent. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's because, you know, then you'll have every other member agent complaining about that. So you've got to find a way, and, and I look forward, and if I can help anyway, let us know. Maybe maybe we can use Home Life to interview them or do something, yeah, right? Yeah, I uh, just that's think a separate often part, these are people who won't sing their own praises. No. They won't post something about what they're doing because there's a – Pretty high degree of cynicism, let's be honest, when a real estate agent says, here's something good I've been doing. But I think as a peak body, we have that ability to actually say, we're going to shine a spotlight on this really amazing work you've been doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know some extraordinary property managers who, uh, you know, they're doing it really tough at the moment because it is such a tight rental market and they get really emotional about all the people that mm. they don't help. You know, ultimately, you can only give that rental property to one applicant, Mm. to one group. And so you know that you've left behind potentially a group of 49 others who wanted it. And that really weighs on them. And and I have been so impressed by the number of property managers who will say, you didn't get this one, but I'm really going to try and get you another one. Mm. Or let me help you to do this. And, And just the number of property managers who you know, in this environment are just trying so hard to go that little bit further because they're recognising how incredibly tough it is mm. for, um, for tenants. Well, even I'm pretty sure it was through Market Buy, wasn't it, that there was one sale that went through and they actually went with the second offer instead of the first yeah. because they were like, no, 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 that the first one's an investor, whereas I want it to go to a, like a – first home buyer or someone that's trying to break into the market. So they actually took a cut, so to speak, in the offer because they were like, no, 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 I want this to go to someone who, yeah. who needs to get into the property now. Mm, mm. That's interesting. That's, there was, it, it's interesting actually. So on that, it is a little bit of a diversion, but on that, um, what we're seeing is about in 10% of cases, it's not the, the top offer that's taken. Mm. Uh, and, Quite often what is happening that is not getting reported to us, but it's, it's anecdotally being reported, I should say, is that we will learn that a, uh, a homeowner has gone, you know, what? You're, we're past where we expected and where we wanted to be. So everything past that point is gravy. So let's now choose based on who this is going to help the most, which is, is, is a really cool mm. thing. Um, of course, that one actually hurts property managers because it takes a property out of, yeah. out of the does, rental market. It does, but at the same time, um, it does give faith. That there, there's the a real estate agent is actually saying, "Look, like you've got a few offers here. Yeah. Um, this per- this is their situation. This is their situation. This is their yeah. situation. So you know, essentially, yeah. who do you want to help? I've heard <laughs> those sorts of stories. Even sometimes where there might be an empty nester who says, "I really want it to go to a young family, mm. to someone yeah. who's at the beginning of their lives, young children, because we want them to replicate the kind of." You know, the family home and the mm. creation of memories and um, even if it means that potentially you might get a little bit less. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. not that real estate agents are just out for money. It, mm. it is that they're wanting uh, the, to actually help yeah. the community as well. well. In, in that scenario and, and in a lot of scenarios, you know, the real estate agent ends up making less. Mm. Uh, but what they've done, and, and this is where it's actually quite impressive, is the agent has learned who the buyers are. They've done their due deal in that con- conversational way that they do and have then communicated that accurately to the seller so that the seller can make the decision. Because mm. at the end of the day, it's the seller's oh, decision. Of oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but it's it's beautiful there. And, and look, there's there's plans to – It was, actually, I love your thoughts on this. It was put to me probably about a week and a half ago. 
that if we can find a way to keep rental properties that are going to market inside that property manager's business so that essentially it gets sold to another investor as opposed to going into the open market, that will actually help the rental crisis but also the overall housing crisis because the biggest issue that we have is properties being taken out of that rental market puts additional pressure on the rental market which squeezes those who are at the top who who can afford end up sort of falling over into the buying market which then increases the pressure there. Yeah, I mean look I think it's a, I think that's always a tough one. I think um we don't want to stop people from being able to become owner occupiers obviously yeah. but equally we are concerned about the diminishing number of rental properties. It's it's I don't know what the right answer is, right? Other than more supply for everyone. I I think that's the magic it's, bullet, isn't it's, it? It's um so yeah. you're telling me something that we'd been <laughs> stressing on so much that supply and demand is what is increasing the pricing, yep. not just in the home, like the buyers and sellers, but also the tenancy renters yep. kind yep. of deal if, as if, well. Like if literally comes back to if you build it, they will come. Like, you know, so it's that constant supply and demand. If we can get an equilibrium or kind of, then everyone will have that utopian thing that we are so striving and so wanting to see being that renters have somewhere to live. Owners who want to get into the market can get into the market. Everyone is housed. Like Yeah. Well, I think our issue is we've just got so many more people renting mm. and then we just don't have yeah. we don't have the stock. We yeah. don't have the housing for them. Mm. And again, like I said, we're up to 36% who rent and if we can get that number down to around 30%, we know that that's, that's about the right range. The split is 70-30. Yeah. 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 And the government's the one with the, the key power in to be able to do something about it or are well, there other players? Look, I think, I think government ha- has a, a, a significant amount of power. Um, but again, it's... It's not just the government, right? We, to be fair, uh, we need to address government and local government can play a really important role in terms of right policy settings, getting out of the way, getting red tape out of the way. Um, we still need people to though developers and builders to have the confidence to build. Yeah. So we need we need the tradies. Um, again, you could argue that government plays a role in that and making sure that we've got the apprenticeships going and all the right settings to encourage people to go down the tradie pathway, doing more to perhaps attract tradies from other parts of, of Australia or the globe. So a lot of that comes back probably to government. But ultimately, we also need confidence. We need builders and developers to wake up and say, yep, yeah, let's go, let's build this thing. Mm. Yeah, I like it. And what you touched on there is something that was done really, really well in the late 90s, early noughties when they first introduced the first home buyer grant. At the same time they introduced that first home buyer grant, they also put a lot of money into the marketing of apprenticeships and marketing of going into an apprenticeship as a really good and viable option post high school. Uh, and so we had a lot of tradies that went yeah. that, that were available. So in terms of labour supply, we we increased the the demand for housing, but we increased the supply of the labour able to actually complete the work that was needed to be done yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. And I think that that was brilliant. I haven't seen much of that in the last twenty years. So certainly they've announced a whole bunch of new grants and and apprenticeships for for tradies. But the problem becomes that that's a bit of a slow burn. Yep. Getting them through, they're generally three to four year apprenticeships. So that's challenging. That doesn't fix here and now. Mm. Um, and again, the challenge is how we can attract some of those tradies from other jurisdictions and get them here into the Sunshine State, those who are already trained up and experienced. Um, but definitely, I think, making sure there's a whole bunch of work we should be doing here and now to make sure that we're not in this position again in the future. So I think those sorts of apprenticeships and doing more to create those pathways to apprenticeships. And look, we are seeing that even at school, you're able to start your apprenticeship a lot earlier while you're doing year 11 and year 12. So those are fantastic programs that we're big, we're big supporters of. 
Uh, but again, we just can't get them fast enough at the moment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> study harder. Apprentice. Study, study <laughs> faster. <laughs> well, yeah. I've been trying to Work push harder. my boys no. to become <laughs> tradies, but alas. Look, it's, you know, it used to be that you, you went to uni and, and got that degree to go and make a good good coin in, throughout your life and, and that sort of thing. But over the last 20, 30 years, the tradies have become, you know, the, the new sort of wealth centre in terms of a career and, and you can't blame them. Like, well, I they went, work hard. I went to um, a high school in the Redlands and I kid you not, even when I went to high school, even now you can't, so to speak, swing a dead cat without hitting a tradie. So <laughs> they're everywhere in the Redlands. So I think it was just a given that if yeah. you – you know, if you didn't do well in school that you just became a tradie. However, you look at a lot of tradies now and you're like, hmm, I really wish my mum had have really pushed me <laughs> into becoming a tradie. <laughs> it's Absolutely. not too late. <laughs> no, you can always, always do the career change. Well, I think I'd love to be a carpenter. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? I would like it? some carpentry skills, yeah. Yeah, mm. it, it's cool just building stuff, I think. Yeah. Just, it's good for the soul. Yeah. I yeah. restore stuff. You do. As a hobby. You That's do. Great. I, I, I learned, I, I, look, I do a lot of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way of learning. Probably yeah, not I, to do I apprenticeship. Like, I love watching people who do their own home renos. I find it fascinating. I'm always really envious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah some of them are amazing too. Yeah. Some of the, I think the thing, like I could, I would back myself to be able to build anything so long as there's... It's not a house. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Even, even then, so long as I've got a reference. Like, if I, yeah. I can go and learn, watch YouTube video, read a book, whatever. Yeah, see, I can't what? follow instructions, so that, <laughs> that wouldn't work for me, John. But the, the issue that I have is I can't create, like, imagine what it should be. Mm. I can build... If you go, hey, go build this, and here's the instruction, I can do that. Yeah. But and, and in the insane thing is in business, if you came to me with a problem, I'll solve the problem. Wait, so you're one of the IKEA wizards? No. I, <laughs> hey, I've built a fair bit of IKEA in my time. I've learned a few new swear words oh, along the way. No. Uh, but it's all pretty much still together. Oh, no, I don't have the patience. <laughs> but I am uh, envious. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's fun. But, yeah, no, look, I think, I think the people who come up with – the new ideas, like, of how something should be visually. Like, I can solve – you can bring me just about any problem and I I, I would back myself to solve it. But if you ask me to create something that's kind of artistic or visual or a new design visually, I would stand blankly. Yeah, Yeah, not me. Give me the instructions in the picture, I'll make it happen. Make it happen. But, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) There we go. Well, Antonio, I think – I think we've touched on everything, to be honest. We've nailed everything. Great. Um, Have we solved all the problems? Oh, I think yeah. we've at least highlighted them so that people <laughs> listening in can can solve. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, ultimately it comes back to, look, we need more houses. How do we do that? It's simple, um, but it's complex. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I Look, the more we talk about the and obviously you and I talk every now and again, you know, at events and, and that sort of thing, but the more that we talk, the more I'm convinced that I need to invest in a 3D housing printer um, <laughs> and, and we can solve the supply problem that way. Uh you know. He's been on me and about then, getting and a and 3D build, printer. And then you can build your IKEA stuff and we're sorted. <laughs> Look, 3D printed house, IKEA furniture. But we won't ask Antonia to come over Just and help us know. to it's, actually it's, construct no, it. No. She doesn't no. like but instructions. I, you know what? It'll be the look of the 2030s. I'm telling you. It'll be 2030 Vogue. You might be right. <laughs> you might be right. But on that, I think, look, we'll, we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, we, thank we do you. appreciate it. We understand how valuable it is. Um, and, and so for you to sit with us and spend an hour and a half with us has been phenomenal. So thank oh, you very, very right. much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. It's, it's, it's been great. Thanks okay, for having me. Okay, so now that we've conquered the uh, real estate in Queensland, are we off to rule the world? Sure, why not? <laughs> let's, let's, let's do that Monday. That sounds like a Monday task. Yeah, do it Monday. <laughs> On that note, see you later, guys. Hope everyone's enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you've got Bye. any questions, hit us up. We'll pass them on to Antonia uh, or we'll answer for you if we can. But uh, let us know if you enjoyed it and we shall see you next week. Peace out. Bye.